Uh, are you are you good to go? Do you have any issues? Oh uh, yeah, I'm. I think I'm all set. Okay. Um. Well, I will say welcome to everyone. Um. So I will introduce this morning's speaker. So we are very pleased to have Hali from the College of Engineering giving a talk about solving biomedical problems using comp computational modeling and neural networks. Uh, he got his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Connecticut in 2015. And currently his research is working to employ artificial intelligence techniques to develop advanced multi-scale models and build predictive AI models that can assimilate data from different sources, such as biophysical, biochemical, genomics, and, and proteomics data to improve digital health technologies. Uh, so take it away. Hey, uh, thank you very much, uh, Holly, for the introduction and also uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to present my uh, recent research work to the IOB uh, faculty members and students. And hopefully, we can open up some uh, opportunity for forming uh, new collaborations. So, as uh, Holly just introduced, uh, my uh, key research area is the computational modeling in uh, biological processes that are related to the human disease. So, here is a summary of what we have, what I have done. Uh, during my uh, PhD and the postdoc uh, period. <clears throat> so for the PhD, basically I've been focusing on simulating a protein, a biological fiber and membrane under the uh, subcellular uh, level. And when I started my uh, postdoc, I started to simulate the biological process at the cellular level. For example, you can see here, I'm simulating a right cell passing through a very narrow slit. And also we can, further increase the scale of the simulation to a blood flow simulation in the microvasculature and also a perfusion of a, a organ. And as we keep increasing the simulation scale, we can also go to the, the millimeter scale and the centimeter scale to simulate the blood flow in the uh, human aorta and also the mouse model. Okay. So the key motivation to develop and use all these uh, computational tools in the biomedical engineering is that first we can use uh, modeling to simulate the biological process that cannot be observed directly from an in vivo uh, study or even from in vitro study. And also we can use this uh, model to, to examine the uh, existing hypothesis derived from human physiology, pathology, and also we can derive new hypotheses based on the simulation result. And also simulations can be used to dissect very complex uh, process that involve many uh, biological factors. And also we can quantify each of their contribution to some critical events such as uh, vessel occlusion, thrombus uh, formation or cell lysis. And also we can uh, closely uh, work with the clinician to help them to make these prognosis and at last, the simulation result can be served as a cross-validation for the in vivo or in vitro experimental observation. Okay, so uh, in today's talk, I'm going to give you an example of how we can use uh, computational modeling and the machine learning and integrate both to solve uh, human uh, disease. So for the disease I'm going to uh, talk about today is uh, it's called sickle cell disease. So sickle cell disease is a genetic disorder. So actually affect more than 100,000 Americans and it costs $3 billion per year. So approximately 30,000 per person. So the life expectancy of the sickle cell disease patients is two decades short than, than the general population. And currently the curative therapy is very limited and also the number of sickle cell disease patients increased globally. So from uh, uh, 5 million to 7 million, so that approximately uh, increased by 40% within two decades. So for the current available uh, therapy or treatment, so there are four options for sickle cell disease patients. The first is a stern cell transplant, but the application of this uh, transplant is uh, very limited because the, the transplant, the stern cell has to come from a very uh, close match donor, such as the siblings. And also people start to try to use this uh, gene therapy, which is very uh, hot right now. 
because in the, just in the end of last year, the FDA just approved the first gene therapy, which is uh, specifically used to treat sickle cell disease. However, this uh, gene therapy is very uh, costly, so the expense is $2.2 million for one person. So this is apparently is not accessible for most of the sickle cell disease patients. So imagine that if we want to treat all the 100,000 patients in states, it's going to cost $0.3 trillion. So that, that's almost 1% of the US uh, GDP in 2022. And another uh, more affordable uh, option is to go through this uh, transfusion program, but it's actually a long-term program and the patient has to constantly have access to a safe, uh, sustainable uh, blood supply. So usually the patient has to live in a bigger city and they have to stop by the, uh, the blood bank in a two to three weeks uh, episode. And also they have this uh, risk of uh, iron overdose. So the, uh, the last, uh, but I think the most affordable and accessible way to treat sickle cell disease patient is still the medications because it's relatively cheap, it's easy access, and it can be uh, used by the majority of uh, sickle cell patients. But to develop and to uh, test the medication, so we need to understand the pathogenesis of the disease. So let's look at the, the mechanism of the disease. So to help you to understand the the disease mechanism. So I want to first give you a very brief uh, introduction for the sickle cell, uh, for the right cell. So we know the human right cell, the major function is to deliver oxygen and then pick up carbon dioxide. Right. So if you look at the individual right cell, it has this uh, biconcave shape. So it's about eight micron wide, two micron thick. So the, mic the right cell has a lifespan of about 120 days in the human body. So during this time, it will travel almost half a million times in the human body. And for each cycle, it takes about 20 seconds. So the total traveling distance will be uh, around 300 miles. And in the human body, so the right cell need to constantly go through this very uh, narrow uh, channels or vessels in the uh, capillary bed where they release the oxygen. At the same time, they pick up carbon dioxide. So if we do a microfluidic experiment. So we can see this right cell is very flexible. So we can see at the beginning, this right cell approaching a very narrow channel, which is designed to mimic the capillary. So the right cell can go through this uh, two micro wide channel. So remember the right cell is eight micro. So it's much smaller than the right cell size. So actually it can be uh, elongated and slip through the channel and then recover its back on cave shape. So this indicates that the right cell have a drastic uh, deformability. So to understand the right cell, why the right cell is so uh, flexible, so we can take a look at the right cell structure. So if we cut the cell in half, so we look at inside the cell, so actually there's no uh, internal structure component inside the cell. So all the load will be carried by the cell membrane. And if we zoom in a small patch of the cell membrane, so we can see that it's made of actually two layers. So first on the outside, there's a layer, there's a lipid bio layer, so very thin with a five nanometer thick. And underneath there's a cytoskeleton that's connected to the lipid bio layer and they are responsible for the elasticity of the right cell. Okay, so now we know the key point from these two slides is that the right cell is very flexible. So because they need to go through very narrow channels in the human body. Now let's go back to the sickle cell disease. So what's happening to the human, uh, to the patient's blood is that there's a genetic mutation for the hemoglobin inside the right cell. So we know the right cell is carrying oxygen, but the oxygen molecules is actually binding to the hemoglobin inside the right cell. So you can imagine that the right cell is like a, a bus but the hemoglobin are all the seeds. So when the uh, hemoglobin is binding to the uh, oxygen, so it's actually can deliver it to the uh, other tissues. But for the sickle cell disease patient, once the hemoglobin is released from the, or the oxygen is released from the hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin will start to polymerize into very uh, stiff fibers. 
So for example, you can see from these two uh, in vitro uh, experiments. So this is a, uh, this is a hemoglobin fiber polymerizing inside a rice cell. And this is the inner solution. So you can see once the solution is uh, deoxygenated, so the hemoglobin quickly start to polymerize into a fiber, and then they will grow to a fiber bundles and the fiber domain. So if we using a high resolution microscopy to look at the structure of the fiber, so you can see it's actually formed by this double strand fiber, but there are seven double strand fibers that are twisted to form this one single hemoglobin fiber. And we know the rice cell is supposed to be very soft, but if we have very stiff fibers growing inside, it's going to cause the alteration of the rice cell morphology. So for example, if you look at the blood smear of the sickle cell disease patient, so you can see there are different shapes of rice cell we can uh, observe from their blood. For example, the rice cell can be an oval shape or can be a stomato side and a side or granular shape or sickle cell shape. So the sickle cell fiber actually not only change the morphology of the rice cell, they also change their mechanical property. So they make the rice cell stiffer. So we know the rice cell need to be very flexible in order to pass through this very narrow vessel in the macrovasculature. So imagine if there are very stiff fibers inside, so they are going to clog the vessel and cause vessel occlusion and pain crisis. And not only the vessel occlusion, actually the rice cell, after they keep cycling and uncycling in the human body, they all become very fragile. So they are easy to lie and rupture. So that's, that lead to a very shortened lifespan. So for sickle rice cell, so the lifespan is uh, 10 to 20 days as compared to the normal rice cell, which is 120 days. So in this case, the patient's uh, frequently and uh, experience uh, hemolytic anemia because a lot of their rice cells are lies uh, premature. So to understand this uh, polymerization of the sickle hemoglobin uh, into this fiber, so we actually can develop a computational model to simulate this process because this process is very fast. It's very hard to capture by the uh, experiments. So for example, in this uh, one of my uh, previous work, we can use a particle-based model to simulate the polymerization of uh, hemoglobin into the fibers. So for example, we can use a coarse green particle to represent the hemoglobin, and we can assign different binding sites on the surface of the, the particle, and then we can let them simulate to form a nucleate, and then the nuclear can polymerize further into a fiber. And if you look at the growing of the fiber, so we can see that by proper design of this uh, binding side and the orientation of the bond between the different particles, we actually can uh, reproduce this uh, structure of this uh, double strand hemoglobin chain twisted observed from this uh, micro uh, microscopic experiment. And also we know that in the red cell, there are multiple hundreds and thousands of fibers. So if we use this type of a very detailed uh, simulation, so it's going to be very hard to simulate the, the polymerization inside the rice cell. So that's why we uh, further uh, expand this uh, approach to uh, develop a more efficient uh, cost screening approach to simulate the fiber. So the idea of this new approach, which we call MARS, is that we know the polymerization occurred only at the two end of the fiber, but for the entire body, so actually it does not, the detailed structure does not play too much role. So we plan to replace the body with a more coarse grain level of fiber. So we can just use one chain of particle to represent the body. And we just leave the a detailed structure on the two ends. So in this way, we actually can largely reduce the computational cost. So for example, you can see that for this new simulation, so once the fiber is growing, so this uh, particle, small particle will be dynamically are replaced by the larger particle to represent the number of particles in the system and to uh, improve the computational cost, uh, improve the computational efficiency and reduce the cost. And now we have no, uh, we have simulated one player of the, the game, which is the fiber. So we want to look at another player, which is the right cell. 
in order to capture the cycling of the right cell. So for the right cell, we already know the structure of the right cell membrane. So we can just divide, uh, develop a model and to mimic the structure of the right blood cell. So for example, here, we can use a one chain of particle to represent the lipid, uh, the spec uh, spectrum filament. And also we use one layer of this gray particle to represent the lipid bilayer. And also we have a different color particle to represent the uh, protein that bind the cytoskeleton to the lipid bilayer. And we can design uh, different potentials to control the mechanical property of this uh, cell membrane. So once we have the cell membrane and we have the uh, fiber, so we actually can put these two models together to simulate the interaction between the uh, growing uh, hemoglobin fiber and the right cell. So now we kind of know uh, the pathogenesis of the single cell uh, disease. So with this model, we actually can expand to understand the, the complications caused by this uh, disease. So this uh, one complication is the complication occurred in the human spleen. So human spleen is actually the largest organ in the lymphatic system. It's actually located on the right hand, left hand side of the body, right above the stomach. So if you look at this, uh, the structure of the spleen is actually contain two compartments. So the one is called the white pulp, another called the right pulp. So the white pulp contain a lot of immune cells. So actually they are responsible for remove all the virus and pathogens in the blood flow. So when the blood flow uh, pass through this uh, white pulp, so they are going to split into two pathways. So one pathway, which account for 80 to 90% of the blood, will go directly back to the vein of the spleen, while the rest of 10 and 20% will flow into this uh, open circulation or the right pulp of the spleen. So in the right pulp, actually the blood will be filtered. So if you look at the some uh, pathological image from the uh, right pulp, so actually the right cell kind of located outside and they try to squeeze through this uh, narrow slit of the endothelium cells in order to return to the circulation. So you can see one of this uh, example here. So in order to squeeze through this, uh, uh, squeeze through this narrow slit, this right cell need to undergo this uh, drastic deformation. So to summarize of what's happening in the spleen, so we can use this uh, schematics. So for example, the right cell, uh, the blood flow basically flow into the spleen and then one 80 to 90% will go to this uh, closed circulation. Well, the 10 to 20% go through the open circulation where the blood will be filtered. So in the filtering process for first, the blood cell will be interacting with the macrophage in the right part. So the macrophage has a function to scan all these uh, membrane proteins on the right cell. So if they uh, sense any alterations on those proteins, uh, they are going to uh, engulf those proteins. So this process is called uh, erythrophagocytosis. So if the right cells can, can skip, escape from the macrophage scrutiny, so they need to go through this very narrow slit before they return to the circulation. So here for the first step, we can consider it as a chemical uh, filtration. So basically it can scan all the uh, changes on the, on the protein. And the second one we can consider is a biophysical filtration. So the right cell has to be very flexible in order to go through the speed. Otherwise it will be retained on the surface of the uh, inter endothelium cells and the macrophage will come in and engulf them. So uh, many uh, study has been performed to understand this uh, filtration function of the, uh, the spleen. For example, uh, people have done this uh, in vivo uh, mouse model to observe this uh, right cell dynamically passing through from this right pulp into the sinus uh, of the, in the right pulp. Okay, so you can see this right cell is uh, squeezing through this very narrow slit and in order to return to the circulation. And also different uh, microfluidics experiment has been uh, designed to simulate this process. For example, people have used the uh, micro, microsphere filtration, where there's a very uh, narrow spacing between this uh, uh, sphere. 
so that only the very flexible red cell will be able to pass through the sphere, while the stiffer cells will be retained. And also we can define a different uh, layers of uh, obstacles and they have different spacings between this obstacle and then the researchers perform different uh, blood samples through this uh, filtration uh, device to see how this uh, red cell are filtered. And also uh, people have uh, performed this ex vivo uh, experiment, which means they get some donated uh, spleen from the patient and they keep them alive, then perfuse blood flow in, through this uh, uh, spleen. And they want to observe what's happening, especially for sickle cell disease. You can see that because uh, sickle cell, we have a lot of very stiff fibers inside the right cell, so they become very stiff. You can see outside this uh, sinus is very crowded. It's because this all this right cell cannot pass through this very narrow slit of the endothelium cell, so they cannot return to the circulation. So they cause a uh, a congestion in the speed. And also to uh, understand this process, because a lot of this process has been done uh, in vitro. So we try to uh, perform a simulation, try to mimic what's actually happening in vivo. So that's why we, we, we developed this uh, RBC model and also the model for the sleep. So we want to see what can happen when the right cell passing through this very narrow sleep. And for the right cell model, it's similar to the model we have uh, introduced before. So we have uh, one layer of particle, you can see highlighted by the right particle as a lipid bilayer, and we have this green a long filament to represent the cytoskeleton, and we have a binding site at the uh, intersection of this uh, filament. And for the sleep size, it's about a 1.2 micron height and a 4, point micro, a 4 micron wide. Now, uh, here's some uh, simulation results. So first we start with a normal red cell and uh, with the surface area 140 micron square and volume is 90 uh, micron cube. So we drive this uh, red cell uh, with a pressure gradient of uh, three Pascal per micrometer. So we can see with this uh, relatively low uh, pressure gradient, so the red cell cannot pass through this very narrow sleep. And then we increase the pressure gradient to five Pascal per micrometer, so we can see this red cell can squeeze through this uh, uh, very narrow sleep. So in the next case, we simulate an uh, aged red cell passing through the sleep. So for aged red cell, uh, is featured by a gradual reduce of the surface area. So you can see here, we just reduce the surface area uh, by 30 micrometers square, and we can see that the this right cell or aged right cell cannot pass through the sleep. So at last, we try to increase the driving pressure to see if we increase the pressure gradient, does it help to push the right cell through? But we actually find that if we just increase the brutal uh, force of the, the pressure, it will cause the lysis of the cell instead of uh, uh, pushing the right cell through. And also we can do some tests on the physiological function of the spleen. So for example, people believe that the spleen facilitates the maturation of the young red cell or reticular side. So the reticular side is uh, featured with the uh, are wrinkles on the surface area because they have ex excessive uh, surface area. So we also can simulate a similar process of a um, reticular side passing through the sleep. And we will find that this right cell is going to uh, release the redundant surface area by this vasculation process. And then after passing through the sleep, they convert to this uh, biconcave shape, which is the typical shape of matured right cell. And also we can use the model to test the different uh, blood disease, for example, the, in the severe cytosis. So in severe cytosis, it's different from sickle cell disease. So the mutation is occurred in the membrane protein that will uh, disrupt the, the connection of the lipid bilayer and the cytoskeleton. So as a result, the membrane become unstable and they, they could form vesicle and leave the membrane. So as a result, the red cell will end up with a spherical shape. So now if we simulate the uh, spherical uh, RBC passing through or RBC in the HS passing through this uh, 
very nicely. So we can see that because of the weakened uh, interaction between the cytoskeleton and the lipid bilayer, so we can clearly see some vasculation occurred during the passage of this uh, uh, sleep. And after the uh, after the red cell losing surface area, we can actually perform some uh, mechanical test for those red cell, and we will find that those red cell will gradually become stiffer as they gradually lose surface area, and the extent of the surface area loss is actually correlated with their extent of uh, protein defect in their membrane. And also we can test another type of uh, blood disorder, it's called uh, elliptocytosis. So the protein defect in the elliptocytosis is a little bit different from the severe cytosis. So the protein defect occur within the cytoskeleton. So we know the cytoskeleton is actually responsible for the elasticity of the red cell. So when the cytoskeleton is uh, disrupted, so you will see that the red cell could not uh, recover to the back concave shape. You will see a lot of elongated or ellipt elliptical shaped red cell in the blood smear of a, a patient's blood. So similarly, we can uh, create this uh, protein defect in our uh, memory model and then to simulate the red cell passing through this uh, sleep, we will find that when the red cell passing through sleep for a red cell with a relatively low uh, defect, so it can still maintain the uh, integrity of the cell, but the red cell cannot recover the back concave shape. But for a severe case, so the red cell just directly break into three parts. So it undergo this lysis process. So now let's go back to the uh, uh, sickle cell disease. So to, uh, to understand how these uh, sickle cell are retained in the spleen, so we actually collaborate with uh, uh, researchers from uh, MIT. So they perform this uh, microfluidic device to mimic the spleen filtration function. So the first, uh, they test uh, the filtration of normal red cells. So we can see there are very small cells that are attached or retained by the sleep. But if we add sickle cell, you can see the some of the cells gradually start to accumulate uh, upstream of this uh, sleep. However, it's not very severe because it's under normoxia where the hemoglobins still have the oxygen, so they do not polymerize. But once they release the oxygen and start to polymerize into fibers, you can see their deformability quickly decrease and they immediately they will start to uh, accumulate upstream of the sleep because of the reduced uh, deformability. So you can see here, we and we know that from the experiment, though the sickle right cell is going to block the sleep, but the, we actually cannot see the details of what's actually happening at each sleep. So to help us to further understand the process, we actually can bring some companion simulation. For example, we can simulate all these normal right cell first, passing through the sleep. You can see that for the normal right cell, because they have very good uh, flexibility, so they can pass through the sleep. There will be no uh, accumulation upstream of the sleep. But if we start to introduce the sequel cells into the uh, simulation, which is highlighted by this uh, purple color and blue color cell. So because you can see the deformability is compromised in the sequel cell, so they are going to start to be retained by the sleep and gradually block all the sleep openings. And by doing this simulation, we actually also can understand what type of uh, sickle cell will create the, the worst damage to the sleep. And here we have been focusing on the filtration function of the sleep. Actually, the other part of the filtration function is related to the macrophage. And we also can simulate this part. So for the macrophage, we know the macrophage can clear uh, age and the disease right there through this uh, erythral phagocytosis process. So actually this process is very uh, dynamic and active. So in one, in every day, billions of aged or pathological altered right cell actually are removed from the, our circulation. So this uh, erythral phagocytosis is a very complex process. It's multi-physics, it involves uh, biochemical signaling and also the biophysical process. 
And in the red part, there's over, there's about like 3.5 billion macrophage actually that actively, acti actively uh, screening the passing RBCs. So let's look at the biochemical signaling part. So for the signaling part, it's actually controlled by some signaling particles, uh, proteins on the right cell, such as uh, a PS, a band 3 and CD47, and CD47 altered. So for the PS and CD47 altered and band 3, they actually send out the EDME signal to the macrophage. So the macrophage will be activated and, and well, the, those signal will create a, a myosin 2A, which is a, a motor protein that drive the phagocytosis process. And also the sql cell, uh, also the right cell can express this uh, CD47, which is uh, send out the do not need me signal. So this uh, signal protein also uh, show up in uh, many uh, tumor cells. So we have a uh, collaborate with the uh, uh, researchers from uh, JGU to develop this uh, signaling uh, model to describe this uh, signaling process between the macrophage and the so right cell. But here, and we show that actually by using this model, we can test the different uh, uh, pathways of this uh, signaling. They can work alone or in combination. And we can actually reproduce uh, the experimental result. So, but here I want to uh, emphasize the biophysical part of this process because uh, an increasing attention has been uh, shifted to the biophysical property of the cell and how do they uh, affect the phagocytosis process. So to simulate this uh, biophysical uh, process of the cell, we need to develop a macrophage model. So for this macrophage model, so we use a pulse green a particle model and we use like four potential to control these models uh, biophysical properties. They increase the uh, warm lag chain potential that can control the elasticity of the cell. And also we have this bending potential to represent the membrane bending stiffness and we have a surface area volume constraint to represent the, uh, the effect of the cytosol and also the membrane. And at last, we add uh, active energy to represent the protrusion force when the macrophage become activated. So to uh, calibrate the model, we compare the mechanical property of the macrophage with the micropipette experiment for the uh, macrophage in suspension and in adhesion. So we actually can see the consistency of uh, or model uh, performance and uh, micro experiment. So next, we uh, calibrate the interaction between uh, the macrophage and uh, micro particles. So we change the size of the micro particle. So we can simulate a very small particle and we simulate a, a bigger particle. And here the particle is assumed to be uh, undeformable. So here we have a, a microfluidic experiment. So we can see the process of uh, a macrophage engulfing a micro particle. So we actually can use our model to uh, reproduce this process. And here um, you can see, so we can test the, the uh, size effect of this micro particle to the phagocytosis process. So you can see when the particle is very small, we actually need a higher adhesive stress to uh, fully engulf this uh, microparticle. If we have a larger microparticle, we actually just simply run out of a surface membrane to engulf this bigger particle. But in the middle, so actually the stiffness of the macrophage does not play any role in this uh, adhesive uh, stress between the macrophage and the spherical particle. And also we can actually calibrate the model by comparing this uh, phagocytic time of the simulation and the phagocytic time from the uh, phagocytosis experiment. And here are just uh, three movies and show you how this uh, macrophage engulfed uh, particle with the different size. And also, then we shift uh, our attention to the sql right cells. So the sql right cells is uh, featured with a different level of increased uh, rigidity. So we can simulate the RBC with a different rigidity and see how they impact the, the engulfment process. So for the movie on the top is a simulation of a very rigid cell and the medium rigid cell and the normal right cell. 
So we can see if you see the snapshot for the ridge itself so during the engulfment process. So there's a very uh, small deformation of the uh, right cell, but as the right cell stiffness is uh, uh, reduced, so the right cell uh, deformation becomes more uh, pronounced. And we actually can uh, quantify the impact of the uh, right cell rigidity to the adhesive energy between the right cell and the macrophage, and also the phagocytic time. So we, and we can see that when the right cell becomes stiff, it actually requires less adhesive energy between the macrophage and their target, which means the lower extent of ligand receptor binding. And also the phagocytic time is much faster when we have uh, increased the stiffness of the right cell. So then we can also study the shape effect of the right cell. For example, we have this uh, engulfment of a granular shape, right cell, and also a elongated shape, right cell, and sickle shape. And also we can quantify the, the impact of the shape to this uh, adhesive energy requirement for the full engulfment. So, and at last, we also can study how the aged red cell impact the, the phagocytotic, uh, phagocytic process. So for example, the aged red cell is uh, featured with a gradual reduce of the surface area volume ratio. So when the red cell have a larger surface area volume ratio, it's more flexible, so we can pass through this uh, slit as we introduced it before. And at the same time, we find that it's going to be very hard for the macrophage to engulf this uh, normal right cell. But for the aged right cell, which can be easily retained by the uh, endothelial slit, it's going to uh, take a less adhesive energy and uh, it can be fast engulfed by the macrophage. So this uh, study actually see the complementary uh, impact of this uh, slit and macrophage in, uh, in removing all this aged disease, aged and diseased right cell. So basically, uh, this is the, the first part of the talk, basically I focus on the competition modeling, but uh, in the last uh, five to six years, actually there's a AI hot wave basically impact a lot of the human life and also researchers life. So a lot of researchers are right now are trying to integrate the AI or a machine learning model into their research. But however, in order to train those popular models like the uh, CN model, transformers, point net, uh, graph net, a lot of uh, advanced uh, neural network models, so we require some big data set, which is kind of a luxury to our uh, university researcher because in mo mo for most of our researchers, we do not have a uh, big data to train the neural network. So actually what we are doing every day is to generate data and publish uh, papers. So if you only have very small data or we have just some data, and we do not have a big data to train the neural network. So how can we uh, take advantage of the AI and neural network in our research? So one solution is to use this uh, physics informed neural network. So the key idea of this uh, PINs or physics informed neural network is to integrate data with a physics law such that we can reduce the requirement for the amount of data we need to train the neural network. So uh, I want to give you a very simple example to understand how this uh, physics informed the neural network works. So first, if we have an object that attached to a spring, then we let go of the spring, so springs start to fluctuate. And because we consider the friction, so we know it's going to graduate, the, uh, the oscillation is going to graduate k and eventually it's going to stop. And from our high school uh, physics, we know this process is driven by a ordinary differential equation. So we have three terms. So we have the first term is the inertia term, and we have this uh, friction term. So mu is a friction coefficient. And also we have this uh, spring force term. So this entire process is driven by this uh, physics equation. So, okay, so right now we know this process and assume that we only measure, we have only 10 measurement during this process, and then we want to train a neural network. Okay. And then we can, here the result of the neural network prediction is highlighted by this blue line. So we can see once we have a 10 point, it's good enough to train neural network. But once we want to 
the neural network to make predictions beyond the training point range. So we can see the prediction quickly deviated from the ground truth. So this is normal because the neural network depends on data. So if you do not have data in this area, basically you do not have a good uh, interpretation, interpolation of this uh, result. But if we know the process of this physical process of this uh, uh, or physical equation that underlying uh, this physical process, so we actually can integrate this physical equation into the neural network and to provide better predictions. So the idea is because we know the, uh, the output of the neural network, which is actually the solution of this uh, physical equation. Right? So if the prediction is good, so that means the physical equation should go to zero. So in this case, we can just add this uh, physical equation into the loss function of the neural network, such that the neural network prediction not only satisfy the, the ground truth, the training data, but also satisfy the physics loss. So in this case, we actually can largely reduce the number of training data we need. At the same time, we can actually make a prediction in the area that we do not have a training uh, data. So this is the uh, basic uh, mechanism of how this uh, physics informed neural network uh, works. And the idea is that we have additional uh, loss function term, basically represent the uh, loss function from the physics law or physics equation. So we can actually, we have uh, expand this uh, physics informed neural network to study uh, infectious disease dynamics. So we collaborate with uh, Dr. Uh, John Drake from the ecology department. So they have developed this type of a very popular compartment model in the uh, infectious disease area. So the compartment model is actually a group of uh, ordinary differential equations. So since we can consider one ordinary differential equation, so we can consider a group. So the idea is very simple. So we just put them into the loss function to make sure that the prediction of the neural network not only satisfy the observation data, which is from the CDC, the public available data set, and also satisfy this uh, uh, compartment model. So if we compare the result of the, the pins and the reference point is actually the ground truth, it's highlighted by this uh, green dot, and the pins is the blue curve here. And we have this uh, original GSST is the compartment model. And we have this uh, uh, neural network without the physics informed part. So you can see for the prediction on these uh, three numbers, the number of cases, number of deaths, and number of hospitalization. So the pins model actually outperformed this uh, just neural network model and the conventional uh, compartment model. And also this uh, pins actually have a lot of uh, applications. So another application is to integrate with the uh, uh, macrofluidic experiment to help to extract the blood flow velocity. So this case is actually happened in the retina macroaneurysm. So the retina macroaneurysm is actually the earliest clinical visible sign of the diabetes retinopathy. So the clinicians actually can watch those signs and to determine how the disease progress. And one feature of the macroaneurysm is that they turn to rupture or leak that will progress to make the disease progress to a more severe uh, state. So to understand why this uh, micro, uh, macroaneurysm rupture, so we actually can look at the hemodynamics or blood flow inside. For example, we have a collaborator doing this uh, macrofluidic experiment. We can see how the blood flow uh, perfuses this uh, aneurysm. And then by using this type of uh, physics informed neural network, actually we can integrate the image from the experiment and directly output the blood flow velocity field. So since I, I think I'm almost running out of time, so I'm going to just ignore all the technical details, just show you the result. Okay, so the key idea is that here we know that in the images, so the, the pixel and also the, the intensity of the image actually is correspond to the uh, blood flow velocity. And there's a coupling equation that we can use to put into the loss function of the neural network, such that if we know the change of the intensity from the image, so we can infer the unknown velocities inside the, the, blood, inside the blood vessel. So this is kind of the key idea. So we can see that by just look at the, uh, the image, so we actually can directly extract the, the flow field from this image. 
And not only we can extract the 2D uh, actually flow field, we actually can uh, expand it to a 3D velocity field, and then we compare it with a very expensive uh, detailed simulation. So we we see that actually our prediction is pretty consistent with the, uh, the simulations result. So another uh, interesting uh, application of this uh, physics informed neural network is to solve yield post problem. So for example, if you have a, a coffee cup, it's a hot espresso, so we know that the temperature gradient around the cup is going to drive some uh, uh, air flow. So that's why, so when you are walking in your office with this hot coffee, you, your colleague immediately can smell it. So to, and we can easily basically measure the temperature distribution around the coffee with uh, some thermal sensor. But it's always very hard to identify the air flow velocity because it's a scalar, it's a 3D, uh, sorry, it's a, a vector, it's a 3D uh, space, in a 3D space. So that's why we can actually use this uh, physics equation. So if you know the underlying mechanism of this process, so it's coupled the uh, uh, heat convection process with the number of stokes equation. So we can put them into the neural network loss function. So we actually can infer the unknown, the velocity and the pressure actually from the uh, temperature distribution around the coffee cup. So at the last, I want to uh, show you another example because uh, for the physics informed neural network, you actually really need to have a ordinary differential equation or partial differential equation. So you can use this a P model. But a lot of researchers may, may say that, okay, I, I actually do not have a ODE or PDE in my system, or it's, my system is too complicated to describe by the ODE or PDE. So in that case, you actually also can use some simulation data and integrate it with the uh, very sparse experimental data using this type of a multi-fidelity neural network. So the idea here is that, that we can use models or we can use a, a uh, we can use a, you experience equations that you think is close is closely enough to represent this process to generate a lot of uh, low fidelity data. So we first train a neural network with the low fidelity data, which is not very accurate. You can see from this uh, figure. So for the uh, blue dot, it's kind of the low fidelity data. We it's not accurate, but it kind of captures the trend of the process. And then if you just have a very sparse, very high, uh, high fidelity data from the experiment, and you can use this high fidelity data to fine tune a small network, and then this small network is going to correct the prediction of this uh, low fidelity network. So this is another way to uh, integrate the experimental data with the low fidelity data, which can be a simulation data, or also can be a, your data from ex uh, your experience, or any equation that is closely enough to represent this uh, biological process. Okay, uh, and that's all uh, for what I want to uh, say to the present today. So at last I want to thank all my collaborators. So at UGA, uh, we have uh, Dr. Drake and Patch and Spencer Fox and XQ. And also I want to thank the uh, collaborator from other institutes. And thank you for your uh, time and uh, attention. So if you have any question, I'll be more than happy to answer. All right, thank you so much. Um, if any of you want to verbally ask a question, just raise your hand and uh, like raise your hand in Zoom and I'll, I'll call out to you. We had a couple questions in the Zoom chat. Uh, so first question from Leandro is uh, asking, what is the smallest channel a red blood cell can travel through? Oh, based on my knowledge, it's two to three macro channel. But if it's a channel is basically have a, it's a, have a length, but if it's, if it's just a slit, like what I show in the spleen, so that one is actually can be even smaller, can be down to like 0 0.5 micro V. Um, and we have another question in the Zoom chat. Uh, for the fiber model formation, is the shape mm. of the fiber structure sensitive to the arrangement of the initial nucleation structure? Uh, yes, actually, it's very sensitive to the nucleation structure and also the binding side and also the binding, the bound angle. So these are all uh, closely uh, associated. Thanks. Uh, Kanan, do you want to ask your question? 
Uh, yeah, well, thanks for the talk. Uh, so I was just wondering if you've applied uh, your physics-based model or have considered applying them for uh, molecular dynamic simulations, right? Because, you know, you could use the Newtonian laws of motion that's employed for molecular dynamics and, and use that within your uh, uh, models. So so I, I'm just curious if you or anyone, or anyone else has sort of considered that uh, approach for, for, for molecular dynamics. Uh, you mean the the physics informed neural network? Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah physics because for, yeah. for yeah, a lot of our research has uh, has attempt to to integrate this to the to the molecular dynamics. But the problem is uh, for the molecular dynamics, the system is really very complicated. It's, uh, it involves a lot of uh, potentials between right. for the bound and for the interaction between different molecules. So there's no uh, very clean like the partial differential equation or ordinary differential equation that you can put into the loss function. So a lot of the time, so we kind of uh, can integrate the potential into the loss function and try to help us to fine tune this uh, parameter in the potential to kind of fit better of the prediction. But uh, for now, I haven't uh, looked at, I haven't found any like larger benefit beyond this point. Okay, well, maybe we should talk. I have some ideas we could explore. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Okay. Just mm -hmm. open to all the yeah ideas and okay. suggestions. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Any students have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask or raise your hand. All right, going once. All right, I think that's it for questions. Uh, thank you so much, that was wonderful. Um, and if anyone has any questions, you can email Holly directly, but otherwise uh, we'll see you next Friday for the next seminar. So okay, thank you very much. Everyone, everyone. Yeah, everyone Thanks so much. Bye.